Good morning, everyone. A lot of folks are still coming in. Well, glad to see everybody. Looks like it's going to be a marvelous day. And uh, if you're with us, we're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. And if you're online with us, we're glad you're here. So uh, just wanted to share a thought. I came across uh, Psalms 100 and uh, thought I'd share it with you this morning. It says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for God is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. I thought that was, that was powerful. You know, so many people try to solve, solve the great mystery. Who are we and where, we came, where, where did we come from? Well, you know, it, the answer is pretty simple. You know, we can, you know, God is our Father. He created us, and he created everything we have and we see in the universe. But so many people want to deny that, and they spend their lives spinning tails and yarns about where we may have come from. But for us, we know we have that peace, and we can live our lives and have some joy knowing that we have an awesome and mighty God on our side. So uh, let's begin this morning with a prayer. Father, we thank you for all you do for us. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for creating us. We thank you for uh, all the words that you've given us so that we can know who we are and what we are and whose we are. We thank you so much for this time this morning to be together and to share with each other, to encourage each other. Father, to praise you and... and uh, realize that you are our great God. We thank you so much for your son Jesus and the love you expressed through him for us and the sacrifices that were made in our behalf. We thank you so much for our eternal life that's coming that will be spent with you in heaven. And it's in his, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Good morning. <clears throat> All right, we're starting this morning with number 524. 524. I know that I got one. Yeah. 
2 Kings 6, 15 through 17. Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And a servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Morning. Morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, open our eyes that we may see, open our ears that we may hear, open our hearts that we may obey, be fruitful, and multiply. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your joy. Teach us, Father, to be cheerful givers of our time, of our treasure, of our hearts. And Lord, augment our ministry here as we augment our obedience to you. Make us over into a body of disciples making disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, one of you came to me this morning uh, telling me that they were coming along with me in, in, in this month's fast, and I'm, I've, that really was encouraging to me. I'm proud of you for doing that. Um, so far, I've behaved myself, except for a, a mishap in Planet Fitness that I confessed in the bulletin, so there you are. <laughs> They shouldn't put Tootsie Rolls by the front entrance. <laughs> Eating, right? You just do it mindlessly. That's exactly what I did, and then my mind came back, and then I, then I, now I have to come forward and confess. Um, I, uh, I suppose by now most of you know uh, what happened, that I was invited to lead the opening prayer at this rally for President Trump uh, in Wolfboro tomorrow. I'll pray for Democrats too, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm a nonpartisan prayer, I was, but I'm honored that I get to do that. And I want, uh, the reason I'm bringing it up to you, I want you to pray for me tomorrow that I do good. By, by, by doing good, I don't necessarily mean doing well. I don't really care whether they think I've done a good job or not. I want to do good in God's eyes. So pray for, pray for that, uh, please. Now, I got something else I want to share with you before I really get into today's uh, comments. And it has to do with something I said from the pulpit a few months back. In May, I preached a sermon entitled uh, The Lying Tongue. And in that sermon, I mentioned that the body count of communism is 70 million. And actually, on that number, I probably understated it. Uh, worldwide, the number who have died due to communism is likely many more than has... Uh, and when one considers every country in which that uh, system has been implemented. But the way in which I mentioned the 70 million dead due to communism might have led someone to think that I was attributing, might have led some of you to think that I was attributing those 70 million deaths to Joseph Stalin alone, because I mentioned that number right after talking about Stalin. Now, he was a brutal dictator, and uh, he did say some things that were, he said many things that were not true, but I never did say that he killed 70 million, but some might have heard it that way. The problem with all of these things with numbers is that historians disagree about the numbers. They dis statisticians disagree about the numbers. Scientists disagree about the numbers. Archivists disagree about the numbers. And then politicians get involved in these matters, and activists get involved in these matters and kind of muddy the waters often making the truth this difficult to ascertain. See, for a while now, I've been visiting with Larissa, who grew up under communism in Russia, in the city in Siberia where the czar and his family was murdered, a city called Yekaterinburg. And while she and I agree on the awful hardship and suffering that took place under communism, she shared some numbers with me that were different than the numbers that, that, that I shared with you a few months ago. These are from the Russian archives that were opened up 
after Russia gave up communism. These numbers, they were researched by Russian historians and based on data from the government archives, and they paint a different, less brutal picture than the other numbers paint. According to these statistics, it was found that from 1921 to 1953, 10 million people were repressed, 2.4 million people were rehabilitated, and about a million were shot. Still brutal, still awful, but different numbers from what I had known before. Larissa agrees with me that God only knows the correct number, and, and she agrees with me that the system was brutal. I hope the main truth I was trying to illustrate, and that is that lies can be deadly. Please remember that. Lies kill, and I hope that will not be lost. We must be people who value this truth, search for truth, go where the truth leads us, and know that Jesus is the ultimate truth. All right, now, let's get down to business. Bible story that we need to consider from 2 Kings. If you would, open up your Bibles, or you can follow on the screen. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 10. I'm just going to begin by reading a bit to you here. Now, the king of Syria was making war against Syria, Syria against Israel. He was not making war against Syria, against Israel. And he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. So God was protecting Israel from Syria. God was protecting the king of Israel from Syria. And it's interesting because Israel wasn't even, really wasn't worthy of such protection. The kings of Israel, if you, if you remember from the time of the divided kingdom, None of them were good. All of them were awful. All of them worshipped idols and led the people into worshipping idols. And, and you see throughout the time of the ten rebellious tribes a diminishment of their stature and their power until they ultimately were, were carried off into, uh, into captivity. So they were wicked. And yet God was still protecting them. What does that tell us about God? Merciful. Patient. He protects us, sometimes even when we're not worthy. Thank God he protects us when we're not worthy. Are you worthy today? Am I worthy today? Without Christ's help, none of us are worthy, right? Now, verse 11. Therefore, the, king of the, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He thought he had a, 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 he thought he had a mole, a spy in his, in his midst. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, He is in Dothan. So the king sent his men sent an army after one man. He's going to go and get Elisha. Verse 14, Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So what's the picture here? You've got, you've got one man, well, two men, one man and his servant, they're in a house, they don't have guards, they don't have walls, and an army is coming after them. How would you feel if an army parachuted down in your front lawn and said, how you doing? You wouldn't be doing very good, would you? Uh, we would be probably uh, at a heightened sense of awareness we would probably be afraid. I think most of us would be tempted to fearfully wonder, just like the servant did, Alas, my master, what shall we do? What are we going to do? Well, we would certainly be tempted to fear like that if we, um, if what we could see was the only thing that was there. But see, that's not the case. There was more going on than meets the eye. 
Verse 16, so he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that we may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of this young man. First off, he's terrified at all these armies coming after him. And then he, then Elisha prays, open his eyes. And then what does he see? What if God were to open our eyes? What would we see? I think maybe we might be more afraid if God were to open our eyes and we could see the spiritual reality that surrounds us. That might frighten us more than seeing some uh, guy with a bazooka coming my way. The reason I feel that way, the reason I think that way is because think of all of the, of the times in Scripture when men interacted with angels. Many, many times the very fir first reaction is terror. But think about that for a moment. Those terrifying beings... The horses, fiery chariots were there to protect. They're not coming after us. They're coming to help. So maybe after the fear goes away, we might be a little more uh, hopeful. See, the servant, what the servant saw was not everything. There was more going on in the unseen spiritual world than we can see through our eyes of flesh. And what is unseen is more powerful than what is seen. We believe that because the scripture tells us that. We believe we accept that by faith. So who really in this scene is in charge, church? The human army of the king of Syria or the angel armies? invisible spiritual horses, chariots of fire. They didn't know, that army didn't know what they were dealing with. They had no idea what they were coming up against. They had their own chariots. They had their own horses. But they were coming against God's horses and God's fiery chariots. No contest. What do you think is going to happen next? Well, let's see. Verse 18, so when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. And now Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. Now Samaria is the capital of Israel. It's the capital city of the northern kingdom. So it was... When they had come to Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and there they were inside Samaria. How would you feel if you were one of those soldiers? Man, oh man. Now when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then he prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. See, they went up there to round up a king, a round up a man who was causing their king a lot of trouble. He was going to be destroyed. Child's play. I mean, come on, just one man. There he was in his house. No weapons, no protection, no trouble. So they thought. They underestimated the power of God. And on this day, it was God's good pleasure to protect the man of God. And for all of this time, it was God's good pleasure to protect the wicked king of Israel. Even though Israel had fallen far short, Elisha was his man, his prophet, and under his protection. Protection that on this day accrued to Israel's benefit as well as Elisha's. Is Syria was humbled, 
Syria was humiliated because of God's purpose and power. I just love that story. It's awesome, isn't it? To see God protect in such a mighty way, to see God toy with his enemies like a, like a cat with a mouse. You ever seen that? Our children are traumatized by that. That happened one day in our house. <laughs> They're still talking about it. To see God's mercy extended even to wicked Israel, even to pagan Syria. See, he could have destroyed, he could have destroyed the armies, just obliterated them. We see stories like that in the Bible where God just kills 180,000 outside the walls of Jerusalem. Or in, 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 in other times, they sent, they sent men after the prophets and 50 were killed, another 50 were killed, then another 50 were going to be killed, but they humbled themselves before the prophets. So we see God dealing with, with, with his enemies in a far more harsh way on many occasions, but on this day, he's gentle. He doesn't kill them. He doesn't destroy them. But does, but does he bring glory to himself in this? All that to me is powerful, powerful stuff. But what I want us to, to uh, take home more than anything else is encapsulated in words we read twice in this story and that, I, that are repeated every Sunday when I pray before I preach. Open their eyes that they may see. Beloved, we have no idea. We're traveling through this thing called time that God created. And we're planted here in a material world that God created. But God is spirit, invisible, eternal, not bound by time, not bound by space, not bound by anything, because every construct that we're walking through, he made. It's his game. And he is more powerful than any weapon, than any technology, any ideology, anything that man in his pride might ever come up with. Nuclear weapons. Who invented the atom? Artificial intelligence, a hilarious term, by the way. Artificial intelligence. Who is wisdom? Who is the source of ultimate wisdom? Germ warfare. He created all life in the flesh. He knows how to sustain it. And he knows one day how to bring it to the end. Pandemics. Woo! They won't let go of that one, will they? Who is the healer? Who is the source of our eternal home once we put aside this flesh? Beloved, our battle is not with flesh and blood, nor is it with any weapon that man can come up with. Our battle is in the spiritual realm against Satan and against his minions. And I know that can sound kind of scary. But the devil is defeated and we're not without power. No matter what they throw at us, we are protected by, provided for, and will one day, sooner or later, go home to our almighty, all-knowing, invincible and undefeated father. My daddy is bigger than yours is. And he can whip you. He loved us so much. Our father not only is all powerful, he loved us so much that he allowed his only son to suffer, to die and to be glorified in the resurrection so that we will live with him for all time. We who follow him will live with him for all time. So what can man do to us? Not much. Killing us won't do much harm. When we celebrate Christ's death and his resurrection every Sunday as we look forward to our own resurrection, 
Ridiculing us won't do much when we follow the Savior. When the Savior that we follow took on death, but he also took on shame. He also took on humiliation for on our behalf. Impovering us much. Impovering us won't do much. When our Father owns the cattle on a thousand hills, everything that man has done to make themselves mega wealthy, they did with things that God has already provided us. And by the way, we've already laid up our treasures in heaven, haven't we? So taking away our money won't ultimately do much to us. I'm not saying we won't suffer. Of course we will suffer for a while before we hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. So really, if we open our eyes, we will discover that we walk in victory as we walk with Christ. Stay close to him. He is the rock. He is the rock of our salvation. And that is true whether we can see it or whether we can't. Try to remember this. Let's talk to our Father in heaven about it. Lord, you are the one. You are the almighty. You're the all-knowing. You love us beyond anything we can even imagine. And so, Lord, we choose today to put aside our eyes of flesh and to try to see through eyes of the Spirit and accept by faith your power and your love and fall on our knees in penitence as we consider your holiness and rest in your protection even though we feel unworthy. We can't make it without you. But the words you have left us tell us that if you're for us, who can be against us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't you want his protection? Don't you want to be forgiven by him? Don't you want to be accepted into his kingdom, his mighty, powerful kingdom, and have a heritage founded in all of these stories that we read in the Old and New Testament, founded in everything that we've learned about Christ? That's our nation and you can be part of that holy nation that royal priesthood how well you've got to be forgiven so you confess christ and you put them on in baptism the holy spirit holy spirit will come and live in you you'll be adopted into the family of god you'll be adopted into god If that's not been your experience, I pray that you'll come forward and express your desire to have that be your experience. Be baptized into Christ. Have your sins washed away. Be immersed into him. Be filled with his spirit. And if you've wandered and you've lost sight of the fact that this is a powerful, powerful kingdom that you've been neglecting, man, come on home. Come on home. Let us know that you want to start over. We'll pray for you. We'll do everything we can to help you find your way back home. Whatever your need is, come to Jesus, the rock of your salvation, while we stand and sing. Tempted and tried, we're afraid to wonder.
Several have come forward this morning for prayer. Um, Denisa wants us to pray for Monica and Justin. She believes that there's an opening uh, with the daughter-in-law, with Monica. And uh, so we're going to pray for that. And um, Linda is concerned about the situation in Israel. You probably heard on the news the bombings and things like that have been taking place, Hamas bombing Israel happens far too often obviously and uh, and the people are in the people are in trouble they're in danger and um, 
Darlene is uh, still looking for someone with a pickup truck, so we need to pray for a pickup and two strong brethren to help me move a couch from my apartment in Allenstown to the Concord Goodwill store. She'll reimburse for gas. Please see or call me, and we'll work out a time to do it before it gets too cold. So Darlene could use some help, and we're going to pray for that as well. And Skip online has said, I would like to thank all my church family in Manchester for what your prayers, for your prayers through this difficult time. I'm feeling much better now, and my foot is almost back to normal. Again, thank you, and God bless. If you've been following that, he's been really, really sick. And it was looking really, really bad, and now it's looking much, much better. So Skip French, right? Skip French. And Alex says, I would appreciate prayers for my sister Rita. She has several masses in her abdomen that are growing quickly. She'll be having surgery to remove them on the 13th, and uh, they'll be sending them out to test for cancer. So um, we'll pray for that as well. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you in all of these matters that have been brought before you, Lord. We pray for your intervention. We know that you're mighty. We know that you're powerful. We know that you're wise. We know that you know exactly what to do with each one of these requests, Some, of, most, all of which are really beyond our ability to, uh, to fix. We pray for Monica. We pray that Denise's conversations with Monica will lead her toward coming back to you, which might lead toward her husband coming back to you. We pray that your spirit would move in her heart, in her mind, in her desire to come to, come to you. We pray, Father, for Linda as she grieves the situation in Israel. It's hurting her badly. And we also pray for the protection of the people of Israel as they are under attack from uh, Islamic um, terrorism. And we pray for protection. We pray for strength. We pray that you would be lifted up. We pray, Father, for Darlene, who needs some help. And we pray that you touch the hearts of those in the congregation or even out of the congregation who are able to help and uh, get, that, get those moves taken care of. We pray, Father, for Skip, and we thank you, Lord, that he's doing so much better. We thank you, Lord, for his gratitude, and we pray that you'll continue to lift him up and, and, um, and uh, deliver him from, from sickness. And we also pray for Rita, Alex's sister. Rita's, Alex is very concerned that she may have cancer, and, we're sure, and Rita, I'm sure, is concerned as well. We pray that you will heal her, that you will bless her, and that you would be lifted up in this, that, that, as, that as you heal her, I pray, pray that she would know that you have done it and become curious about, uh, about uh, the God of Abraham. We need your help, Father. We thank you for your help, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. song before the Lord's Supper today will be number 383, <clears throat> 383. Jesus, King.
Every now and then I get these strange thoughts. You know, you get an idea in your head and you just kind of chew over them over and over and try to take them to a logical conclusion. One day I was driving and I was praying. Hey, you know how when you see people, say, hi, how you doing? You know, well, when I talk to God, I say, good morning, Lord. And then this particular morning, I says, how you doing? And then it occurred to me, does God ever have a bad day? Does God, I mean, is there ever a time where God is sad over what is happening, what he sees is happening with his creation? And then you think that, well, then I thought that before anything was ever created, God knew how bad it was going to get. He knew that it was going to go badly off the rails. And so thinking that after I make the creation and after it goes off the rails, what am I going to do so that I can still have a relationship with this creation of ours, with us? And if you read scripture, before God brings judgment, he almost begs his people, please repent. Don't make me do what I'm going to have to do because one, God is purely holy. God is purely just. God cannot have fellowship with sin. And then I start thinking that God wants to have fellowship with us, but we're sinful. How can he do that? And so uh, we gather around this table on the first day of every Sunday, and it's, it's to remind us of how much God does love us and to what extent he has gone so that we can be acceptable, we can be with him. God wants us to be with him, but God will never force us to be with him. It is entirely our choice. And I suspect, and God is clear when he says that he takes no joy in the, when an evil man falls in the death of an evil person. He doesn't take joy in punishing evil. And I suspect that on the last day when he brings the end of time and he has to separate us from those who want to be with him and those who don't, that's not going to be particularly pleasant for him. And again, this memorial, the bread we take, which represents Jesus' body, which was given up for us. This cup, which represents Jesus' blood, which is the cup of the new covenant, which atoned for all the sins of the world, where we have a choice if we want to be with God by doing what, what Danny called us to do, uh, to obey the gospel, to repent, be baptized for the remission of our sins, in the book of Romans, we're told that when we are baptized into Christ, we are clothed with the righteousness that is not as own, our own. So we get to be with God because of a righteousness that's not ours. And all of that, God put into play, gave his only begotten son so that to demonstrate the love that he has for us, and he now begs all of us who have not to please consider where you'll be spending eternity. I would love to have you spend eternity with me, but I won't force you to do that. So let's think about that as we take of these emblems and come to appreciate how much God loves us and to what extent he goes to demonstrate that love for us. Let us pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are a privileged people this morning as you have allowed us to come before your throne. As we are sitting in our seats and standing here, we know full well of our sin. 
We know full well of our rebellion, and we know full well that you love us, regardless of all of these things. Because it was proven long ago on a hill called Calvary, we are only son, sinless, perfect, beautiful, loving, died on our behalf, died because we are in need of a savior. Each and every one of us here, Father, are in need of a savior. So we come before you to remember your son, Father. Each and every first day of the week, we have this bread that represents that body that was hung upon the cross. And I ask you right now, Father, to draw us near to that cross where your son willingly went and died for each and every one of us here. And each and every one of us in this world and all those who have rejected him as well. Father, as we take this bread, let us remember Jesus. Let us remember his love for us. And we pray, Father, for all the souls who have yet to put on Jesus. It's his name I do pray this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Our glorious God and our Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to share a meal with you and to share a meal with each other. Lord, we know at one time we were all enemies to you. We were dead in our sins. We lived for ourselves, subject to the ruler of this world. And Lord, we are so grateful that through the death of Jesus, we can pass from death to life and that he has eternal life in him. And he came to give us a life that is abundant. A life that is full of light and joy and peace. All of those wonderful fruits of the spirit that we've been talking about over these past few months. And we know it came at a cost. And it came at the cost of his life. But we know, Lord, that even for those who are your enemies, you love them. 
You don't take pleasure in the death of wicked people. You desire that all men should come to know the truth. You desire that all men should repent and be saved. And for those of us who've made that choice, we are so glad that we get to share this meal with you and we look forward to the great banquet in heaven when we can be with you for all time, resting in your bosom, enjoying your company. And Lord, we pray that though we may be outnumbered in this world by people who seem evil, we know that you're on our side. We pray that we could treat our enemies the way that you treated us when we were your enemies. Let our goal always be to bring them into the family rather than to punish them, because we know that we received grace in a time where we should have been punished. And help us to reflect on the blood of Jesus that makes all of this possible. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. This concludes our observance of the Lord's Supper. Now we'll be taking up an offering, uh, just a few words. One is uh, to our visitors. We are pleased that you've stopped by our way and please understand that you are considered to be our honored guest and that you are under no obligation to participate. However, if you choose to, we accept anything you care to give with gratitude, and I'm sure God will be pleased. But the rest of us have made a commitment to God that we would support his work by giving as we have been blessed. And so we provide that opportunity at this time. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we are here this day to be together to worship you, 
to spend time getting to know each other better, to encouraging one another in the faith, learning more of your word for our lives, that we become more faithful in the things that you would have us do in leading lives of righteousness in our homes, in our neighborhood, in our jobs, wherever we go. We hope and pray, Father, everything that we do will glorify Christ. I pray, Father, that as we give back a portion of our funds that you provide us with, that we'll do so with cheerful hearts. We're grateful, Father, for this opportunity, but let it not be the only time that we give. Help us to be giving wherever we go. And remember how much you gave. You wouldn't even withhold your son. Thank you, Father. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Dear God, thank you for this wonderful day you've given us. Thank you for being such an amazing God. Thank you for being so amazing that our words that we have can't even describe you. Describe you. And thank you for being powerful and forgiving. And thank you for always being there for us in tough times. And thank you for always answering our prayers in whatever way you see fit. And thank you for giving up your son so that we could see you someday and that our sins could be forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen.